many users were connected to the same computer, and the user had the illusion, in any, every, every individual user had the illusion that the computer was just serving that user. Mm -hmm. The computer was fast enough so it could serve you and move to the next person and the next person and the next person and come back to you and you didn't ever, uh, you were never aware of the fact that it left you. The Internet and the World Wide Web were really born right here at the U.S. Pentagon, headquarters for the world's most powerful fighting force and home with the squarest jaws on the planet. A sack full of money was set aside to fund far out scientific research as part of the so-called space race. Like most Pentagon projects, it had a strange acronym, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. But DARPA had very little to do with defense and a great deal to do with the research interests of the people who controlled the money. As NASA achieved the first docking in space, Bob Taylor took over ARPA's responsibility for spending the Pentagon's budget for computer research. In most government funding, there are committees that decide who gets <clears throat> what and who does what. And uh, in ARPA, we, that was not the way it worked. The person who was responsible for the office that was concerned with that particular technology, in my case, computer technology, was the person who made the decision about what to fund and what to do and what not to do. So um, the decision to start the ARPANET was mine, you know, with very little or no red tape. I was sitting uh, in my office in the Pentagon, and to communicate with people at Santa Monica, I had to move to sit down at this terminal here. And if I wanted to talk with the people in, or the computer in Berkeley, I had to get up from this terminal and go over and sit at another terminal, go through a different protocol, a different command language, the same for MIT. So it's, the obvious question is, wait a minute, why don't we have one terminal and have all of these places interconnected? It might not be an intergalactic network, but even interstate would be a huge step. The universities ARPA funded weren't enthusiastic about the so-called ARPANET. But many of the uh, people in charge of the computing facilities at these ARPA-supported places saw uh, the uh, ARPANET as a threat in the sense that it meant that someone from another part of the country would be using some of your precious computer time. The typical response was, why? I say, well, look, you, you know, you'll be part of a network, and you can use other people's networks, and they can use your, other people's computers, you can, and they can use yours. I say, no, nobody can use mine. It's overloaded right, 100% right now. Don't touch me. Initially, some of the universities that had these host sites weren't incredibly enthusiastic. I mean, they would say, why do I want anybody else to use my computer? I'm busy enough right here. Oh, I don't want to share anything of that on the guy's side anyway. We've got our own, uh, you know, uh, uh, fish to fry. People were totally unwilling to do it. However, each of these sites was being supported, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars a year by ARPA. And ARPA said, you're going to join this network. And sure enough, they did. In 1968, the Apollo program succeeded Gemini and lunar missions began. Meanwhile, Bob Taylor was pushing his plan to link ARPA-funded mainframes at UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, and Stanford in California, and the University of Utah. So ARPA issued a request for quotations to 140 technology companies. The brief was to invent the first ever digital computer network. Massachusetts is famous for much more than just the Boston Tea Party, which happened over there in Boston Harbor. It's also renowned for Boston's twin city across the river, Cambridge, home of two of the most high-powered scientific institutions in the world. But beyond Harvard and MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, there's another outfit often called the third university on the Charles. It's a high-tech engineering company called BBNN for its founders, Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. In 1968, BBN was ready to take its place in networking history. So let's meet some of the team who would unexpectedly change the world. Californian Dave Walden made juggling the hobby of choice around the ARPANET community. Frank Hart was a systems engineer from Yonkers with a reputation as a tough manager. Severo Ornstein, musician and rock climber, later founded Computer Scientists for Social Responsibility. This outfit was ready for the challenge issued from the Pentagon. Here's another word from the cringely glossary of geek. Packet. And since this is the very foundation stone of the internet, please pay attention. We have two computers, and they are connected to each other by a digital network. We want to send a message from one computer to the other. Do we send it as one big chunk, 
or lots of little chunks. Well, it's much easier to put sand on a pipe than boulders, so I say little chunks. These chunks are called packets. And the first thing we do is we number them so we know their order in case they get out of sequence going over the network. And we add some extra information to them that says where they came from and where they're going. So that if, for example, there's a traffic jam along here, the network can redirect them through another computer. That's called packet switching. This is how the internet works. Of course, there's no guarantee that the person on this end is actually going to read it. To build a network linking mainframe computers over telephone lines, in the 1960s there were two monster companies you'd expect to be involved. But both AT&T and IBM declined to bid. When I asked AT&T to participate in the ARPANET, they assured me that packet switching wouldn't work. So, um, so that didn't go very far. The telephony attitude um, I hope my phone doesn't get cut off. <laughs> the telephony attitude uh, is not very compatible with packet switching. What is the telephony attitude? Well, the telephony attitude is we're going to guarantee certain capacities. It's, it's, it's about guaranteed levels of service. It's about investments that, uh, that you make that you get back over decades. Um, and the world is simply moving much faster than that. The difference between a person talking on a phone line and a computer sending bursts of data is simple. Computers do it quickly and more efficiently. Sorry, Mom. So while NASA was sending men into space, the team at BBN was shipping packets down phone lines. Basically, I knew nothing. I would also say that most of us on the team didn't know anything about packet switching because, in fact, we were inventing packet switching. By an odd coincidence, the ARPA-funded scientist designed the blueprint, wrote the software, and built the computers for the world's first digital network, just as NASA's Apollo program reached its lunar climax. Two visions of science and technology, one begun in 1958 and the other in 1961, would both deliver the goods within a few weeks. Kinda neat, isn't it? I wonder what became of the space program. Come here, I want to show you something. It's right over here. This is a historic machine. It's the first IMP on the ARPANET. IMP stands for Interface Message Processor. Today, we'd call it a router. Back then, it was a mini computer that was connected to one or several mainframes here at UCLA and made possible packet switching. The packets would come in, the IMP would sort them out, error correct them, and either send them to those local machines or later, when there were more IMPs, send them across the ARPANET. Oh, you can tell this thing was built for the military. It's built like a tank. And for the first 7,792 hours of the ARPANET, it made sure that we got a message instead of a mess. After just nine months' work, the moment of truth. The first imp was ready to be blitzed with bits. On budget, on time, this was a government project? My laboratory was the place where the internet came to life. It was then called the ARPANET. We, were the we had the first switch, which was called an imp, an interface message processor. It was wheeled into my laboratory over the Labor Day weekend in 1969. And on Tuesday of that next week, we had bits moving back and forth between that switch and my host computer. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Seven weeks before the ARPANET sparked to life, Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Time will tell whether Apollo or ARPANET meant more for mankind, but there's no argument who had the better sound bite. A month later, a second imp was ready at Stanford. What memorable message was sent? 